And that's what the point of this teaching is. I'm going to walk you through some of the differences between the Greek and the English compared to this one. I'm not going to show you everything because there are just slight subtle word changes in some of the verses that aren't really that different. But I'm going to highlight the big things that were found. We're getting back closer to the source of the Hebrew writers. So let's look at some historical background. If you look to the right, you could see the outer cover of this manuscript. This manuscript is not alone. It comes with the Jude. I don't have the translation yet for the Hebrew Jude. If you want to go and look at this manuscript for yourself, it is in the British National Library. And this is the code website link that you can go punch in and look at this manuscript yourself. One of the things you got to look for when you're looking for James is you want to look for Yaakov. Yaakov is Jacob in Hebrew, and that's going to be important in a little bit. And it was presented as a gift to the English King Henry VIII by some Sephardic Jews as a gift. Henry VIII ruled from 1500 to 1547. So we know exactly when this physically got into the hands of the British. And one of the exciting things that this particular manuscript holds up is the keeping of the law and the Torah. So as I mentioned, we're going to be looking for Yaakov. The introduction of this manuscript starts with the epistle of the emissary, which that means apostle. And it says, Yaakov says. That's what you see on your right. This is actually the manuscript. And why do we have Yaakov? Why do we have Jacob instead of James? And that is because King James himself, he wanted to insert his name. So he had Yaakov, which was Jesus' brother. He had his name change to James and in that time it was James because the J was not invented and so later in history we backdated and said that those two names are somehow related when really they're not related at all it was just King James wanted to put his name in there so if you're looking for James you have to look for Yaakov another thing that we're going to be finding I'm not going to point out all of them but this is a listing of all of the times in which the manuscript says god's holy name yehovah and so you can see it says it 11 times and then there's one particular time where it should have stated god's name but i suspect and a lot of others also suspect that the transcriber had made a slight mistake but for the purpose of uh, Hebrew writing, they always use symmetrical numbers or biblical numbers. And so I think it should have said 12 times God's name, but it doesn't. It only has it 11. And so we have to work with the manuscript that we have. Now let's get started. So the first one that we come to is chapter 1, verse 7. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. In the Hebrew, we have, For do not let this man think he shall receive a verified gift of Jehovah. So this is right out the gate, using God's name, his holy name, instead of the Lord. Verse 8. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. In the Hebrew, a man with two hearts will wander as a vagabond in all his roads. So this is just some examples of them just using slightly different words, but they're still stating the same thing. And for the most part, the Hebrew James does a lot of that. But it doesn't change the sentence. It doesn't change the meaning of the sentence. Verse 12. Blessed is the man that endures temptation. For when he is tried, 
he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. In the Hebrew, happy is the man who endures trials. For after his trials, he will take hold of the crown of life, which Jehovah promised to give to those who love him. Notice we have another Jehovah. Verse 14. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away from his own lust and enticed. In the Hebrew, God will be wounded by means of the man. He, the man, will be enticed by the lust of his soul and be crushed following her, the lust, path. So I found it interesting that instead of the man being the focus, it starts out with God being the focus, that God is going to be hurt by the man and his actions, and that the man is going to continue on chasing love. Have you ever thought about your actions might be hurting God? That's something to think about. Verse 25 in chapter 1. But whoso looks into the perfect law of liberty and continue therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. In the Hebrew, it says, But anyone who observes himself by the whole Torah, which is the instructions of the examiner, and, and stands in Torah, not hearing it, the Torah, in forgetfulness, for if he works the work, his happiness is in his actions. And so notice is instead of the law of liberty, it says the whole Torah. And it also adds the examiner. This is the first time I've ever seen God being called the examiner, but he is said to examine our hearts. That's in Psalms. And so it, it's fitting and makes sense that God is the ultimate examiner. And notice it's who stands in Torah. That is the instructions of God, the law. And he is happy and he is blessed when he does that. Verse 26 in chapter 1. If any man among you seems to be religious and bridles not his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is vain. In the Hebrew we have anyone who is well known among you as holy, Kodesh, or Kodosh, and he will not restrain his tongue. His heart is led away because his holiness is false holiness. So notice that it doesn't use the term religious. It uses the term holy. We are to be holy, set apart. This is more in line with the Torah. This is more in line with the scriptures. We're not to be religious. Religious and religion is man-made. It's man's attempt to have a relationship with God. As opposed to God stating what we are to do and how we are to worship him. God has made it clear. We're not to play religion. We are to follow his rules and instructions. Now we're into chapter 2. In the English, we're looking at verse 8. If you fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall love thy neighbor as yourself you do well. Now I see a lot of people use this verse 
to say, well, we're not under God's law anymore. We're under the royal law. And they'll say that the royal law is whatever Yeshua or Jesus said while he was here. But he didn't state all of the commandments. He stated a bunch of them. So we just follow those particular ones. And that's the royal law. They'll say because he didn't preach about the Sabbath, that that's not in the royal law. That doesn't make any sense. But that is what people say. Let's look at the Hebrew. Maybe the Hebrew can clear this up. In the Hebrew verse 8 in chapter 2, it says, If you keep, guard, and protect the king's Torah, as it is written, you will love your neighbor and do good. So now we are to keep, protect, and guard the king's Torah. What is the king's Torah? Well, that comes from Deuteronomy where the king is supposed to write his own Torah scroll with all God's commandments. And so it is the law. It's God's law. There's no way around that. The royal law is the king's Torah. The king's Torah is God's Torah given to us through Moses. So what are we supposed to do? Keep guard and protect it. Verse 12. So speak you... And so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. In the Hebrew, so speak and so do like those prepared to be judged by the Torah of the examiner. So you see again, the law of liberty is the Torah. It is the instructions of God, the law. There's no way around it. Verse 20 in the English. But will you know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? This is a very powerful verse. Many people go to this verse when they're trying to show if you don't have the actions, you will die. You have to have faith, but you also have to have actions. Let's see what the Hebrew says. Verse 20 in the Hebrew. Will you wish to know, O man, son of vanity, that faith dies without action? So now it's faith that is dying. And I see this all the time. People who are really zealous about God and about learning the Bible they hit a wall where they're not doing anything. They're not getting their actions involved. And then they start to fall away. They start to forget all the things that they read because they're not actually getting involved. They're not actually doing anything. They just have it mentally. And without the actions, it's, it's actually going in reverse. And they fall away. This makes a lot of sense to me. Chapter 4, verse 4 in the English. We're examining the differences. You adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. In the Hebrew, we have verse 4, Do the adulterers and adulteresses not know that the love of the world is enmity against Elohim, that is God? All who desire to be loved by the world are an enemy to Elohim, that is God. So the difference here is instead of friendship, which is not all that connected, it uses love or loved. And so I think that's actually closer to what people do. They're not just friends with the world. They're actually in love with the world. They're in love with that other side and they can't break it. They can't leave it. 
And so we are called to come out of the world, to break with our love of the world, to cross over and to follow God in obedience. Verse 11 in the English, speak not evil one of another brethren. He that speaks evil of his brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. Now let's look at the Hebrew. It says, do not slander my brothers about one another man's evil, for he that slanders and judges is the same as he that slanders and judges the Torah. And if you judge the Torah the same, you are not keeping the Torah, because if you judge, you have become the Torah. This is steering us back to being loving of one another, even if someone is doing wrong, or not to harp on their on their problems and slander and call people names. And notice it adds at the end, because if you judge, you become the Torah. So you need to be in line with the Torah. Because if you're not keeping the Torah and you judge, you are becoming the Torah. And you need to be centered and in line with God in your actions and in your deeds. Moving on to chapter 5, we're looking at verse 4. Behold, the hair of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you, which is of you kept back by fraud, cries, and the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Now, a lot of people will translate this verse as the Lord of the Sabbath, but that is not correct. We're going to look at the Hebrew because it really does clean up this textual problem of calling it the Lord of the Sabbath. Here's what the Hebrew says. Verse 4, Behold the wages of the workers, the harvesters of your fields, who you did not pay, he would cry, and the harvesters will cry, and it will come to the ears of my Lord of Sabaot. That is a Hebrew word, and it means host or armies. So the Lord of the host of armies. And this is important because what the Greeks or the English translators did is they tried to transliterate Sabaot uh, in Hebrew into this word Sabaoth. And it is not Sabbath. It means armies or host. And anywhere you see in the Old Testament where they're using Lord of Sabaoth, it's actually not Lord, it's Yehovah of Sabaoth. Yehovah Sabaoth, Yehovah's armies. And so that is the twelfth place that we are supposed to have God's name. This is a textual problem. Someone probably did not include God's name here one time and then the manuscript got changed so this should be Yehovah Sabaoth but we don't have it so we only have 11 times where God's name is used this is actually our last one chapter 5 14 it says in the English is any sick among you let him call the elders of the church and let them pray and pray over him anointing him with oil in the name of the lord and notice i have underlined church pray over him anoint him with oil in the name of the lord 
let's look at the Hebrew. The Hebrew is quite clear on what we are to do. Verse 14. If any man, Adam, among you will fall ill, the assembly, it doesn't say church, it says assembly, or congregation, will summon the Kohanim. Who is the Kohanim? The Kohanim is the temple priest. But let's continue on. Will summon the Kohanim, and they, the Kohanim, will pray over him, and they, the Kohanim, will anoint him with oil in the name of Yehovah. So, what we have here is a modification of the text in the Greek. So, the Hebrew actually stands with the process that is outlined in the Bible of what do you do when someone's sick? You go to the Kohanim and you have them prayed on and you have anointing oil put on them in the name of Yehovah. So, this particular Hebrew manuscript proves it is authentic to the first century because you would not have this written down if the temple was destroyed. To have this in here shows that James, Yaakov, was still under the impression that the temple is valid and if someone is sick, they are to continue on with the process of going to the priest and getting prayed and anointed on. What this likely has in the English is a modification showing that the church, possibly the Roman Catholic Church, edited their text to include the word church or to have the focus on the elders of the church. They have removed the koanim from this text, making it the church has authority to pray over people and to anoint people when they're sick. And notice at the end, it does not have the name of God. It has the Lord. So we have smoking gun proof that the text was modified and that the Greek text was changed to fit with a church system. And so I'm not saying that we can't anoint people and we can't pray over people. There are verses that you can use for that. What I'm saying is for the process, they are to go to the Kohanim and to be prayed over and be anointed on at the temple. And we can't fulfill this particular verse. A lot of people in churches will pray. They will anoint people. And I've heard them say, I don't understand why it never works. It's possible that it's not working because you're doing it off of a verse that it doesn't mean that. It's actually supposed to be for the Kohanim. But that is what the text says. I think the Hebrew is the original. I think that this verse is supposed to be for the Kohanim because that lines up with the Bible. And you can also see Yeshua telling people to go to the temple and to continue out their process when he healed the leper. Uh, he was also using the Kohanim uh, because that's what is written down in the Bible to do. So this is 